the West Virginia Mountaineers go in to the bounce house in Orlando and they bounce the US UCF Knights by the score of 41 to 28. What does that mean for the rest of the season and what are my thoughts on each side of the ball after that game, after seeing it live and in person? I'll also tell you a little bit about my experience visiting the bounce house and what I think of the atmosphere, the stadium, and etc. So pull up a chair, sit back, relax, because we're going to talk about all of that right after this word from my sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Dutch Miller Automotive, where friends and family pricing means you get the best deal right up front on any new or pre-loved vehicle in stock every time. With brands like Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GMC, Buick, and Subaru, the Dutch Miller Automotive family is always growing and ready to put you in the car or truck you've been searching for. Check out our inventory across West Virginia at DutchMillerAuto.com or come in today to the home of friends and family pricing only at a Dutch Miller Automotive store near you. What is up, college sports fans, Big 12 fans, fellow members of Mountaineer Nation? Welcome into another edition of Kuzo's Corner. Bell yourself up to the bar and let me serve you up this shot of top shelf college football content. On tap in today's episode, we are talking about West Virginia's 41-28 victory over UCF in the bounce house in Orlando. The first thing I'm going to do is talk about each side of the ball, some takeaways I had, what it means going forward for the rest of the season, what it means for Neil Brown, and then at the end I'll touch a little bit on my experience at the bounce house attending the game. First of all, let's talk about the offensive side of the ball for West Virginia. Okay. The offense looked really good. I mean, when you pull up the stats, which I'll do here, I'm not going to share them with you on the screen necessarily, but I'll read them to you. I mean, first downs, West Virginia had 25 first downs. They were 7 of 15 on third down efficiency, which is good, and 2 for 2 on fourth down. So they were basically 9 of 17 on, uh, on you know, end of drive downs on offense, which is really good. 450 total yards of offense, 164 of the yards passing, 286 yards rushing. They were basically running the ball at will against that UCF defense, which – I knew coming in they should be able to do. They were able to do that. Uh, a couple of individual performances I want to touch on. C.J. Donaldson ran for over 100 yards for the second time this year and for the first time since the pit game. So shout out to him for that. He looked like his old, he looked like his old self again. So shout out to C.J. Donaldson. Also, Garrett Green looked really really good. Uh, he was 15 for 24 passing, 6.8 yards per per completion. Uh, didn't have any touchdowns, but he also had no interceptions. Garrett continues to do a great job taking care of the football. Uh, I have a, in, a special video planned to talk about him coming up probably tomorrow. Uh, this is I'm, I'm recording this on October 30th, but I'm hoping to get that video out in the next couple of days. But I have something special planned for just to talk about him specifically. But uh, time of possession, West Virginia dominated the time of possession, 36 minutes and six seconds. That's been their calling card this year. They are just controlling the clock running the football and controlling the game. And that's what this team, that's what this team's identity is. They have, though, started throwing the ball much better than they were early in the season. Garrett is feeling much more comfortable throwing the football. I feel like the offense feels much more comfortable not only running but throwing the football. The receivers are starting to make some plays after the catch now. They did have some drops in this game, which is not good, but they, I'm sure they'll clean that up. Uh, Preston Fox had a nice catch and run. Devin Carter was the leading receiver on the day. He had a couple of good catches. Rodney Gallagher, a couple of catches, and, and run also a couple of nice runs in, on reverses and whatnot. So he had a good day. So just all-around great performance by this minor offense. Jaheim White, really good day for him. He ran for about 85 yards, I think, on only like nine carries. So a good day for him. Uh, he, he's Him and C.J., to me, give us that kind of thunder and lightning combination. In that backfield, and then Justin Johnson can also do some things when he's in the game as well. But in this game, it was really C.J. Donaldson and Jaheim White that were the keys. With Donaldson, I felt like I was telling the guy beside me, who was also a Mountaineer fan, thankfully, inside the bounce house there at the game, I was telling him, you know, maybe C.J. not starting took some pressure off of him. You know, the guy has not played running back a lot. He'd only played seven games last year before getting hurt. He came in this year with a lot of high expectations from the outside, uh, even from the national media, everyone everyone knew who C.J. Donaldson was. You know, that's a lot of pressure for a young man, especially at a position he's really not played very much. So maybe by not starting, he had a little bit of the pressure taken off of him, and he was able to go be him. He was able to go run, be more loose, be himself, play more freely. Maybe that's the key here. Maybe you don't start him. Maybe you start Johnson or White, bring C.J. in. He started out coming in a lot on third downs early in the game. 
He was kind of the third down back, and they had some success with it, so they started leaving him in more, giving him more carries, and it worked. So uh, kudos to them for the coaching staff for doing that. And I thought the coaching staff really drew up a great game plan offensively. thought they did a great job. Uh, the one the one play I questioned was the one play that Garrett had to go out of the game. They brought Nico in. Nico threw a little short pass to Preston Fox, who then tossed it basically back to uh, Jalen Anderson, who then fumbled it and fumbled away to UCF. I didn't really have an issue with the play call. I had an issue with the personnel. Jalen Anderson had not even carried the ball, or I don't even think he'd been in the game all day. So that's kind of a tough play to come in the game cold and run, into my, in my opinion. I had no issue with the rest of the play call necessarily, or even with Nico doing it because it was a short, easy throw. Uh, but I'm not sure Jalen Anderson's the one you run that with. Run it with CJ or with or with Jaheim, in my opinion, because or even Justin because they were more fresh. But you know, it didn't hurt the team. Uh, I'm not even sure. I don't even remember now if UCF scored on that possession. But nonetheless, I don't think they did. So nonetheless, it didn't end up not hurting them. Uh, that was the only turnover on the day. Like I said, Garrett threw no interceptions. They only had four penalties for 35 yards. So, again, a clean game from a penalty standpoint for the most part. So, they're, they're getting back to what they were doing early in the year and playing clean, uh, for the most part, mistake-free football, or at least limited mistakes. Now, on the defensive side, it didn't look good early. Uh, UCF was able to move the ball at will pretty much early in the game. Uh, but what I what I saw that here's what I think the game plan was going in. I, I'm looking forward to hearing the coach's press conference later today as I'm recording this in the AM hours on Monday morning. But it looked like they were, you know, UCF was one of their their calling card. Really, on offense was big plays. They had a lot of big explosive plays early on in the season in their previous games. And I think Jordan Leslie's game plan was to keep everything in front of them and not let them have any. And they were willing to give up some dink and dunk stuff but nothing major and nothing over the top. And they, for the most part, I think they they did that. I mean, UCF did not really have any major explosive plays in that game that I can remember. And when they did attempt to get explosive plays, West Virginia ended up with interceptions. Uh, West Virginia turned turned John Rice Plumlee over four times, three picks and a fumble. So they did a great job forcing turnovers. Now, I know a lot of fans are going to say, well, those were unforced turnovers. And I thought the same thing. And one of them probably was. The one where the guy bobbled the ball and it bounced up and ended up kicking it up in the air, that was kind of a fluke play. It was a funky play, as the announcer said on television. A lot of people thought he said something else, but he didn't. He said funky, F-U-N-K-Y. But, you know, Beanie Bishop was there to make the play. He made the play, caught the ball, and did something with it afterwards. Now, in the one interception, it, the guy beside me made a good point. He said it looked like John Ross Plummy punted that ball. It went way up in the air like a, like a punt and just came back down like a Hail Mary almost. And I thought, man, what a, what a terrible throw. But when you watch it back, when I went back and watched it on the replay, his arm actually got hit on the throw by Edward Vesterinen. Edward Vesterinen, hats off to him, was able to get pressure on John Rice Plumley and force that errant throw, which allowed uh, Marcus Floyd to get underneath it and intercept the pass. So hats off to Edward Vesterinen for forcing that throw, which was a forced turnover in my opinion. The other, the other one, Beanie Bishop just made a good play on the ball. Now, John Ross Plumley should not have thrown the ball into double coverage like he did, but nonetheless, he Beanie Bishop made the play on the ball like he's supposed to do in that situation. And and again, got a few yards. I think he got a few yards after the catch. But uh, but the defense, like I said, it was a bend but don't break style of defense early. I mean, John Ross Plumley was you know picking us apart with the short and intermediate stuff. And he, I think at one time he was had not thrown any incompletions other than the picks. I think it was almost 20 throws he had made in a row outside of the interceptions that were completions. But then in the second half, the defense bowed up. The defense, I think if I heard correctly, I heard this on the Three Guys podcast, I think I heard him say that we held UCF, or they held UCF to 27 yards rushing in the second half. So the second half, the defense came out, they bowed up, they made some big stops when they needed to make stops, which allowed the offense to, to pull away because the offense, like I said, was pretty much scoring at will. So them stepping up and making some key – they didn't look lights out. The defense did not play lights out, but they made key stops when they needed to make key stops. They forced some turnovers and allowed the offense to do what they do. If this offense continues to play at this clip, the defense is not going to have to play lights out. All they've got to do is make stops at key times, maybe force a couple turnovers, and this let this offense go win the game. Now, that being said, we could play some tougher defenses in the next few weeks. BYU, Oklahoma especially, uh, maybe even Cincinnati and Baylor. But 
I think I like the direction this offense is going. They, they're getting a little bit better each week, it seems like. And I think if they continue to play like this, West Virginia is going to be a hard team to beat. Now, the defense, though, has been decimated with injuries. They started the game, obviously, without Trey Lathan, who's out for the year. Hershey McLaren wasn't available for the game. Jai Favaris, who was Trey, who was backing up Ben Cutter, who's starting for Trey Lathan, he's, he was out for the game. And then during the game, Marcus Floyd got injured. So I, I I don't know the status of his injury. I'm sure – I'm hoping Neil Brown will update us on that later today after I record this video. But nonetheless, this defense, after being decimated with injuries, guys were able to step up. Andrew Wilson-Lamp wasn't available for the game either, but guys were able to step up, make plays. Jacoby Spells played some snaps. Raleigh Collins came in and played some snaps at the spear position. They were able to move Malachi Ruffin from corner to safety for a few plays in order to get spell some reps and to give, you know, some of the safeties a breather. Uh, Caden Beiser came in and, and spelled Ben Cutter for a few snaps. So guys are having being asked to step up that haven't played much this year. Uh, and I felt for the most part, they did a decent job. They did, you know, there was some, there was some missed tackles, but man, I'm telling you, Ben Cutter played a heck of a football game. He had the highest PFF grade of any player on the Western defense. His grade was in the mid eighties, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I'm basing it off memory here, but he had a grade of like 85, maybe 82, somewhere in there. But he graded out really, really well from PFF, Pro Football Focus. And keep in mind, guys, this is a true freshman. Now, special teams. Michael Hayes continues to do a great job. He made some had some really good kickoffs, kicked it through the end zone a lot, placed the ball really, really well, I thought, on the ones that didn't go out of the end zone, forced forced fair catches. Uh, he did a great job, made his made his field goal attempt. Got to give uh, hats off to, to – Ollie Straw pinned him inside of 20 on, on his punt. I think it was the only punt of the game, if I'm not mistaken. But he pinned him inside the 20. So he did a great job there. Uh, actually, Ollie Straw punted twice. I'm looking at the stats now. Ollie Straw punted twice, an average of 43 yards a punt with both punts inside of 20. So great job pinning teams inside of 20. And then I was wrong. Michael Hayes actually made two field goals in the game. Uh, he's long from 41, and he was five for five on extra points in the game and just continues to be a reliable kicker for the Mountaineer team. Uh, but and Preston Fox had the one kickoff return for 19 yards. Uh, just some really good individual performances and really solid individual performances on this team. Now, the negatives, again, the defense needs to do a better job, uh, you know, covering the deep and – I'm sorry, the short and intermediate throws, I think. The tackling was still not great. They missed a lot of tackles more so than they should have. The defensive front did not play as well as they normally play or at least as, as well as they played in the first couple of games of the season. So I'd like to see them do a little better, get a little bit more pressure on the quarterback. But that being said, uh, the defense overall played a pretty decent game. UCF's offense is good, folks. They're no slouch. We can say what we want to about them being 0-5 in the league. It's not, in my opinion, because their offense is inadequate. Their defense is bad, and they turn the ball over too much. They do move the football well, and they've done it against everybody they've played. So – I, you can't put this really on on totally on West Virginia's defense being bad. Some of that you have to give credit to UCF's offense as well. But that being said, this West Virginia team, man, I hope they get some of these guys back that are injured. I'm not sure the status on McLaurin. I'm not sure the status on Floyd. We know Lathan's out for the year. They really cannot afford any more injuries in that in that defense, especially at the linebacker and secondary spots. This one hit after another keeps coming, but they can keep continuing to find ways to win. Let's hope they can keep it up. I am concerned about the depth of the defense at the second and third level moving forward for the last four games of the year. Hopefully, guys can continue to step up and make plays. What do I think about the rest of the season? I'm not going to get into what I did last time. Last time I started talking about, well, this team could finish this and they could finish with nine wins, ten wins. I'm not going to talk about that anymore, guys. We need to. I'm going to do like the team would do and focus one game at a time. What do, so I think take, coming away from this UCF win, it's a good win. I'm happy we won the game. I celebrated it. But at the same time, there's more work to do. They're 5-3. and three. They've already exceeded a lot of people's expectations, but they have not exceeded their own, I'm sure. And they haven't exceeded mine. I picked this team to win seven games. That's still on the table and very attainable. And I think they can even do better than that. But let's take it one week at a time. They have a BYU team coming in next week with that jabroni Keaton Slovis, who none of us can stand in Mountaineer Nation. We owe him some payback from last year when he was with Pitt. Hopefully they have that video of him saying F West Virginia playing on the big screen in the locker room all week. We owe him one. 
We have him coming to Morgantown this week. That team is very capable of beating West Virginia. There is no game on this schedule. Yes, every game on our schedule is winnable, even Oklahoma. But every game is also losable because of the parity in this league. West Virginia cannot afford to have a letdown game like they did against Houston and like they did in, in the fourth quarter against Oklahoma State. They have to bring the same energy, the same attitude, the same mentality every single game in order to win these games, and hopefully they can do that. I'm hoping that Houston game was a lesson for them, and they're able to to, to play, come out ready to play each and every game. Now, as far as Neil Brown goes, I'm I'm, I'm I don't think he's necessarily off the hot seat, but I do think he's improved his position. Uh, I think it's a one game at a time approach right now. You know, let's let the last next two or three games play out, see what happens. And then let Ren Becker make his decision. Uh, if the, if this team ends up winning nine or ten football games, I don't see how in the world you can get rid of it. Now, if they don't, if down the stretch they drop a couple games that they should win and they don't look good, you know, then it's a different conversation. Um, but that being said, I you know I think he's I don't think he's changed his position from last week. I do think he's still I, I think his seat's still a little bit warm if not hot, uh, and I do think he needs to win at least. I don't know, two or three of these games down the stretch to, to, to be safe uh, at the end of the year. I want to hear what you think, though. Do you think his seat's hot or not, or do you think his seat has is, is cooled off a lot and he's going to be safe going into 2024? I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section. Also, guys, don't forget to hit the thumbs up button. It really helps this YouTube algorithm, helps my channel grow. Don't forget to share it with your family and friends. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't helped me get to my next goal of 7,000. Thank you for getting me to 6,500 while I was in Orlando for vacation. Now, my experience at the bounce house, I want to talk about that for a minute. The campus where we parked, uh, kudos to them for having free parking, by the way. Uh, a lot of stadiums don't offer that. They have several areas to park that's free. You, you just have to walk further to the stadium, but kudos to them for having free parking. Uh, still didn't have to walk any further than I walk in Morgantown, and down there it's flat, so it's a little bit easier to walk. But their campus, I had to walk through campus to get to the stadium. Very nice campus, uh, you know, beautiful campus. Walked across a nice little bridge over top of a pond. They have a nice fountain. They have palm trees on their campus. Really nice campus down there in Orlando. The fans, they were fine. There was some trash talk from the students as we walked through, you know, nothing out of the ordinary, some F West Virginia chants. Again, nothing out of the ordinary. That's college football. It's part of uh, part of the part of being a student section, part of the atmosphere, part of it. I had no issue with that. Uh, never had any fans come up and thank me for coming like I've had in the past at, at some games. Um, they weren't overly friendly necessarily, but at the same time, they were also not they were not negative or mean or hateful or anything like that either. Uh, we had some people around us that were a little on the annoying side, you know making jokes about Garrett getting injured, things like that, which I called him out on, by the way. Um, but other than that, man, I felt like it was, you know, it was it was a good environment. Their stadium, uh, I was underwhelmed. But, they're, again, they're just now coming into Power 5. Once they're in Power 5 longer and making Power 5 money for a longer period of time, I'm sure they'll make upgrades. But, uh, you know, metal seating, which is extremely – make does make it louder in there at times, especially when people are stomping and jumping. Uh, but I'm not a fan of it. I prefer the concrete myself, uh, but nonetheless, they have the, con the the metal seats, the metal metal bleachers, uh, and the metal walkways and, and the whole bit. Their concourse area much to be desired. They need to add bathrooms. They don't have near enough bathrooms there. They have they have you know the quote unquote fancy porta potties that they bring in. Um, you know they're okay. I mean they work, but they do need to up their concourse, uh, make it better in my opinion. But again, it's a stadium that only that holds what is it less than fifty thousand, so it's not a huge stadium anyway. Uh, I guess based on the attendance they normally get, you know, it's probably about the right size. Now the atmosphere inside the stadium, I was actually underwhelmed. They call it the bounce house. The only people that were really bouncing when I, while I was in there were the student section. Uh, there were a lot of empty seats, but I'm sure that's because the team hasn't been playing real well. They were on a four game losing streak. Fans have a tendency not to show up if your team's not playing well. That's how it goes, right? I'm sure if it's a good season, they were winning, it would it would have been packed in there because it was homecoming week. They had a lot of, you know, Shaq was there as a DJ. He, he, he was there to DJ some activities before the game. So, I mean, I'm sure it would have been sold out had the team been playing well and would have been, uh, would have been more impressive, uh, in my opinion. Uh, that being said, um, 
Oh, and I did get there a little bit late too. I got there just a couple minutes before kickoff. So, uh, I, I did get there before the team ran out on the field, so I did get to see the entrance. But uh, and again, there wasn't a whole lot of people bouncing, to be honest with you. So it didn't it didn't feel like the quote unquote bounce house that they talk about. But again, smaller crowd, less excitement because of the team's record. So it's kind of part, you know, kind of kind of comes with the territory. But I will say this: I will give the crowd credit during big moments of the game. The fans that were there were really loud. Their fans that were there were passionate. They were into the game. They were cheering. They were screaming. They were yelling. They were your typical passionate college football fans. Uh, and they got really loud. For that size stadium, it's loud. And I think the metal enables the noise to affect to be even louder. The way it bounces off that metal, I think it makes it louder and makes it a little bit tougher. And I do think it impacted a couple plays for West Virginia where they had to call timeout. Uh you know, maybe couldn't hear signals and whatnot. So I do think the fans that were there did a good job of being loud, did a good job of affecting the game the best they could. But, again, uh, I was not that impressed with the uh, environment there. Uh, it did not live up to my expectations, but maybe my expectations were too high. I want to hear from UCF fans. Was it just because of the smaller crowd that, that it wasn't as lively as it normally is, or did I just come in way too late? I don't know. Uh, what should I? What did I miss? Nonetheless, uh, guys, I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section again. Also, guys, if you want to support my channel here financially, a couple different ways you can do it. Check out my merch store. Uh, I've got my new logo on merch now. Uh, I've got the West Virginia versus the world design. I've got the West Virginia Jack Daniels design. I've got several different designs to choose from. You can get beanies, hoodies, T-shirts, ball caps, coffee mugs, all kinds of items to choose from. Also, guys. I'm proud to announce I have I now am partnered with Onnit Athlete. Onnit Athlete makes trading cards for college football players. This is an NIL opportunity. If you want to buy now, West Virginia is not available yet, but it's on the way. But if your team is available, I'm going to leave a link in my description box. You can click that link and go see if there are cards available with your team. These are just regular trading cards, like where you like we baseball cards and stuff. We, we some of us collect. This is the college version, and the players get NIL money when you make purchases. So whatever, whoever you're a fan of, see if your team's available yet. I think they have 20-some teams available so far. There's more coming. But go check it out. See if your team's available. If they are, buy yourself some trading cards and help out the, your players on your team with NIL opportunities. On it, Athlete, I want to thank them for partnering with me on this opportunity, and obviously any purchase you make, I will get a small commission from the sale. Also, you can join my channel. See the name scrolling along the bottom of your screen. These are my pub-level VIP members. It's $2.99 a month. Take advantage of the perks that I have to offer there for my members. There's also a club level for $4.99 a month that have a couple extra perks, including merch discounts through a special link, a, a special Discord server, and occasionally I will give you early access to videos with limited ads. Those are a couple of the extra perks that come with being a club level VIP member. Also, you get your name along the bottom of the screen and for all members, and you also will get custom shout outs. I want to get right now give a special shout out to Mike Rayner. Mike Rayner upgraded his VIP membership from pub level to club level. So, Mike, I want to give you a shout out, man, and thank you for supporting my channel here at Kuz's Corner. That being said, guys, I want to thank you for tuning into this video. It went a little bit longer than I anticipated, but nonetheless, I had a lot to say about the game. Uh, so you guys let me know what you think. Don't forget to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share it. With that being said, guys, I hope you have a top shelf day in Q Country Roads.